what is the driving force to keep you grinding like you are? Because you're still hungry to this day, mm -hmm. still grinding. Mm -hmm. um, man, I'm destined for greatness. I, I, I come from, I feel like I come from an era where like to be considered great or a legend like you, you were definitely putting in work mm -hmm. to obtain an accolade like that. Now, you know, it's kind of, it's tossed around loosely, but I come from that era and, um, you know, it's like, if you're going to do something, you got to be the best at it. That's like, that's the mentality that, that I try to keep in mind. I just, I want to be like, I know I'm fucking ill. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how blessed I am. I know who God created. And until the world knows that, I got work to do. This documentary is a result of meditation. Meditation on the question, why? Why is it that I have this burning desire to create? After a wild journey of creating 700 YouTube videos, X amount of subscribers, millions of views, the question kept popping up, why? We did an interview with a super producer by the name of Droid whose story was inspiring, but was also confirmation that we were headed in the right direction, that we were meeting the right people. He introduced us to a guy by the name of Vaccine, and I had a burning desire to reach out to this guy. I saw so much inspiration in his art, in his creativity, his story. He's a man who's accomplished things that only people can dream of. And in connecting with him, I wanted to bring that inspiration and that energy closer to those who need it. What should I expect? Just open conversation? Yeah, just open, open conversation. Open, open conversation. Mm -hmm. Maxine, uh, nice to meet you finally in the flesh. I've been following your work for a little while now since we did the interview with Droid. And um, huge respect for you, man. Just from the outside looking in, um, I see you putting in the work. Um, and I visually see the work now. It's amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about you, man. Where are you from? What's the story? <laughs> well, first, I appreciate you having me. You know, always dope to connect and just be able to share my story. Um, grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. As you can see, I, I don't think I ever see people wearing Jaguars hats. So they're like, nah, you're from Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. um, grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Moved, um, I spent a good majority of my life there and was just a creative child. I always knew I wanted to be creative. Art, visual art was like my first passion. I've been drawing and doodling and whatnot since I was, you know, a toddler. Um, but I got into music in high school and that's, I think, I think the music bug is like what really pulled me in and, um, you know, I fell in love and I think, um, I think there was the connection to the hip hop culture, which was huge for me just growing up. Um, you know, just being immersed in, in hip hop, it was like, you wanted to be a part of that, you know what I'm saying? So that way of life you know hip-hop became a way of life for me and behind that i started pursuing um you know writing poetry which evolved into writing songs mm -hmm. and then i started producing just out of necessity not really having the budget for production and um just slowly started taking things more seriously um you know throughout over time like in high school it was kind of you know, just like something we did and it was cool and we had a little group, but then after high school, it was like we started taking it more seriously. And um, I had a opportunity after I, after I dropped, I ended up dropping out of, of uh, college, like after my, like the beginning of my second year. And that um, that's honestly where music really became um, the focus. You know, it was just like, okay, I, I, I don't think it was, oh, you're not in school, let's do this. It was just like, well, while I figure out what I'm passionate about, I know I'm passionate about this, so let's take this seriously. And that's really where I started to dive in and just tr try to um, put those 10,000 hours in, so to speak. 
I was just working on developing my, my own talents and my, my, the group that I was a part of and started producing for other acts and um, around Jacksonville. And um, I got this opportunity to move to South Florida and with the company I was working for T-Mobile at the time, just, just working a job, you know what I'm saying, to keep those bills paid and, and do what I love. Um, but when I was working for T-Mobile, I had the opportunity to move to either Tennessee, to Nashville, or Fort Lauderdale. Um, and my, the, the homie that I was rapping with at the time, he, his mom lived in Fort Lauderdale, so it was just like, okay, this is the universe aligning things. I can stay in Florida, you know what I'm saying? So ended up moving with my homie, um, my other best friends, so two of my best friends, you know, we moved up, moved down to South Florida, had a job. Um, they even gave me like a relocation fee. So I was in a good space to where um, I could focus more on my passions and not have to dedicate so much of that time to, to the nine to five grind, you know what I'm saying? So um, shortly after, you know, I went part time and I had, um, I think we just finished our CD, our first CD, which was, you know, we, we spent years working on. Um, and for whatever reason, my, my, my partner, he just kind of up and quit. <laughs> and it didn't, there was no announcement, it just happened. Yeah. And um, that was like a huge turning point for me, to be honest, because I, I never, as much as I enjoy writing and, and, and rapping, like I never wanted to be a solo act. Mm -hmm. So that's the moment I started becoming much more focused on my production. Um, and at the same time, in the same breath, like that same month, I, I had, I came across an opportunity to intern for Slip and Slide Records. And this was another life changing moment for me, you know, it was just like the universe putting all the pieces together. Um, so I took the internship, within a month I was an official A&R for Slip and Slide Records and, you know, my, my, like they let my, it's like you let me get my foot in the door it was a wrap i was just there was nothing that you, no task that was beneath me there was nothing that i could not do you know what i'm saying i'm going above and beyond to show my value and i i definitely think i did that like i said I, within a month i was an a and r and then i was brought on to ply's project as the product manager and just my career my business career on the music side um just really took off very quickly and um you know it's like the deeper i got in on the business side the less time i had to spend creating my own stuff mm -hmm. um so music just it it was quickly pushed to the back burner um but I can't even say it's fully on the back burner because as a producer, you know, my role just evolved. It evolved, um, you know, I still would produce, yeah. um, but it just evolved more into the producer a and role, into the creative executive role. And that's something that I can say gave me an advantage at every step of my career, just having that producer background, knowing how to work with creatives, being a creative myself mm -hmm. and moving that way, you know, to make sure that creators aren't getting screwed, you know, which has been a huge part of what, just what I have done on a day to day basis, just and yeah. building a team. And, um, you know, like after I left Slip and Slide, I was there seven, I believe seven years yeah. um, left there, kind of felt I reached my ceiling done a lot you know stepped into the music biz working for a major independent that had nothing but gold and platinum artists so you know it's like i was i, I left with a foundation i left and moved to la which was a huge risk no family no you know nothing out here i moved to la with my girlfriend at the time we ended up breaking up like two three months later so, you know, going from having some kind of foundation to absolutely no foundation. Yeah. Um, but then that's when things really, really took off. And mind you, I haven't mentioned art whatsoever because it was nowhere on my radar. It was a hobby that I would do. Um, you know, I work on stuff here and there, but music was just day in, day out. From the time I was creating to even once I got into the business, yeah. as hard as I was going prior to that, I was going 
a, you know, a thousand times harder once they let me get my foot in the door. Because it's like, oh shit, I'm, you know, it's legit now, you know, the dream, it's happening. It's happening. I got a couple questions. Yeah, so, yeah. Two, two things. Who were kind of like your influences at the time? Who were you listening to from an artist perspective and, and producing wise? But then a two part question. Also, how did your perspective on the music industry change because you were like outside the industry trying to get in and then you just immediately dove in? Um, influencer, influences on a creative level. Um, off top, Kanye for sure, RZA, DJ Premier, um, Organized Noise. Like off top, that's those were my influences. Yeah. And Organized Noise would probably be number one. Mm -hmm. um, just being from the South. All of those were just like so heavy inspirations for me, which was it's kind of surreal because I just met Rizzo last week. Like I actually I saw, saw that. that. I saw that too. And it was like <laughs> it was such a crazy moment because you know I'm telling you how instrumental he's been in my journey, but in that moment I was introduced to him and somebody was celebrating me and like this is an incredible artist vaccine. You gotta meet him. He's been his work has been on insecure. His work has been here, 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 here. And I'm just standing here and it's just like one of those surreal moments like, wow, I'm, this is how I'm being introduced to RZA, you know what I'm saying? And it was funny because RZA was like, yo, he's cool as fuck. He knows he's, he's that good. I was like, I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm just here in the moment, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this is beyond me. This is surreal. Somebody that I look up to and respect that's inspired me on so many different levels, like, I'm being celebrated here, you know, as I'm introduced to him. So it's just, just a dope, dope moment where it's like life will remind you like, okay, you've, you've come a long way. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You put in a lot of work, a lot of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's actually, his wife is my uncle's wife's sister. So oh, when right. I saw that, I was like, it's a small world Very right there. Very small. Mm -hmm. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as the, um, you know, the impact it's it made a huge impact that's a great question because my my love for music i want to say it disappeared at some point like it's it completely completely alters the experience mm -hmm. um i've always been a fan first i'm, I'm passionate about music mm -hmm. and Getting into the business side, being exposed to all the fuckery that happens, all, all you know, everything that you don't hear about, yeah. and seeing how creators get screwed, even though there's this epic moment, like yeah. a lot of times you can't even celebrate. And that's ironically when I talk about my music business experience, I've been incredibly blessed to do epic things that most creators will never do. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Period. But it's such a bittersweet experience like every time i share my music business experience i'm just like i'm gritting my teeth like mm. yeah because i'm just i've experienced so much betrayal and i've experienced so much negative uh energy from something that i have a love and passion for and have that have you know given so much of myself to um and it's like no matter what you achieve in the in in entertainment it's like that bullshit never ceases. It never stops. There's never a point where people are like, oh, okay, well, actually, he's been around for a while. Like, we respect that. We won't try to... That never happens. You know what I'm saying? It's just mm -hmm. like, nah, we're going to try to screw you any and every way possible every single time. Wow. Wow. And it's just, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's so crazy. And that's just, that's one level. We won't even talk about the level that, uh, of what we deal with just being black in the industry, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, it's not a business that's created for us to succeed. And we've come a long way, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, pe you know, these companies are eating off of our creations. Yeah. Hip hop is the culture, you know what I'm saying? I and we, gonna, yeah, oh, not to cut you off, we just did a K-pop panel with this uh, Berkeley, the college, uh, what is it, Berkeley mm -hmm. college, of college of Music. Yeah, but I never really sat down and like, put thought to appropriation. So one of my questions is like, 
deep down in your soul, how do you feel about it? And I know that you've been involved, especially in the K-pop industry, of providing or you know either those connections or I don't know if you actually wrote a song in the industry um, with K-pop, but how do you feel? As it pertains specifically to K-pop? Or, or just appropriation, period, but... Um, I mean, if we're going to single out K-pop, which I've seen a lot of, mm -hmm. um, it's like we got to single out everything else. We got to single out pop music in general. You know what I'm saying? Like, appropriation is, like, that's pop culture. Yeah. It's like, let's see how, how what we can get from, you know, what we can steal from them, you know, from us. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's... That's been our experience, you know, like everything we're doing at this point is to reclaim and and create our own stories, you know what I'm saying? Um, I definitely feel a way about it, but the, what can we do? We can we can make the difference that we can make individually, you know? That's what you guys are doing. Yeah. That's what I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? Like walking and leading by example. Um, it's like that, the, the, the BS is always gonna be there. Yeah. It's always gonna be there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm grateful at the same time. I can't, I can't shit on K-pop because K-pop has opened doors for me that US artists haven't, you know what I'm saying? Tremendously and um, yeah, this, the, you know, you can, find, you can find negative to every situation. Mm -hmm. I understand the conversation because we are the ones that are going to Korea and writing the records, but mm -hmm. I've been out to camps and I've seen, it's not just us, literally. You know, there's people from every walk of life. I've been on multiple camps in Korea and it's not just a camp where, oh, it's just a bunch of black sitting in a room, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I've ne I haven't been to one all black camp. So, it's not like it's completely, I mean, we excel at what we do. Yeah. We're the best at what we do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's cool. Man. Who's going to write from a perspective? Like, who's actually been through shit like we have? Who has Nobody. substance to talk about like we do? So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, we could look at the negative side of, of how it's being taken advantage of, but we're, we're also getting those opportunities that other people aren't mm -hmm. and couldn't and, and, you know, wish they could receive. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a double edge, you know. I'm glad you said that. Like, that's why we're here, honestly. It's like, take our perspective and take what we see and makes it make things better. You know, art is a huge passion of mine. Like, I grew up pencil and paper art as well. Like, I got an art scholarship when I was a kid. And um, it's something I kind of let go to the wayside. I became more of like an athlete and got into like gaming. <laughs> and shit. But, um, Honestly, I just feel like when it pertains to like black culture, it's not really owned by us. Like ma the majority of hip hop music, you can look at some of the most epic catalogs and it's, if you follow the paper trail, it's not owned by us. Mm -hmm. And then even today, it's like the mainstream media is going to push whatever is selling. Like, and for me, that pushes to the forefront extremes of certain parts of black culture that are like hyper it happens on an individual level like you said like people need to make a difference if you are in the industry and in, in hip-hop if you're in movies whatever it is entertainment you have to take what you know and take ownership of it and i feel like i want somebody to see this and you know make a difference you know whether they're in our circle your circle or just randomly coming across this i feel like it's time to for us to own what we are creating that's important because at the end of the day what do we really own you know what i'm saying even if you get into the the 40 acres and a mule conversation is like ownership what what do we really own yeah. even our intellectual property like what do we really own? It's, it's, it's a dope point that you brought up the, the catalog because if you, I don't know if you've been paying attention, like catalog, music catalogs in general are selling for an all, at an all time high. People are cashing out on their catalogs, like major icons, like a Mick Jagger, or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cashing out big time. Hip hop, like I haven't seen any hip hop star that's cashed out that even owns their masters you know what i'm saying like very few artists own their masters like as we get towards this the newer generation like the younger generation is definitely more hip yeah. um but 
it's like we're missing out on these opportunities and the value's there. The value is definitely there. Definitely a mixture of knowledge and, you know, yeah. why, access. Why is the time now for people to start owning their masters? Um, it was always the time. It's just, I think people are more aware and have the possibilities with just technology, internet, you know, everything taking over and leveling the playing field to a certain degree. Yeah. It's like now you don't, you don't, like you're, the, you know, a major is always going to serve its purpose, yeah. but if you can get access to the same fans, the same people, yeah. you know, and st and own your masters and control more of your story, like that's what it's really about, controlling, you know, your story, controlling your narrative and being able to you know, move freely, do what you want with your own music, not having to ask somebody permission to release or you know, do something with your body, your creation. You know, mm -hmm. I could never, never fathom having to go to somebody else saying, hey, can I release this painting? Like, you know, I did it, but please, wow. like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's crazy, yeah. mm -hmm. crazy. But so many people are in that position and it's better, it's better now Mm -hmm. Compared to like, you know, 60s and 70s, yeah. where like some of my favorite groups are Parliament Funkadelic, James Brown, you know, cats who iconic, but they should be, you know, they should have, there's no way they should have ever hit a point in life where things were low, you know, financially. Because we still listen to that today. Yep. I was on the plane <laughs> listening. I told him I was yeah. listening to all 70s on the way here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, wow, it's crazy to think that those artists. I don't see a piece of those streams that I'm streaming, man. That's that's crazy to even think. Um, so you left off on your story. You moved to L.A. Talk about the transition from Slip and Slide Records to eventually getting some K-pop placements. Um, L.A., the move to L.A. was it was a huge transition because I went from dedicating my life to somebody else's to, to my dream but somebody else's company yeah. and you know when you work for an indie label typically any company period um you're on call you're on you're you know like any time of the day any time of the night that phone ring you need to pick it up and <clears throat> excuse me you throw in the dynamic that i'm doing what i love i'm, do I'm already pursuing my passion you know you just 24 7 is that de was dedicated to slip and slide and i didn't have a problem with that um so moving to la, LA it was just different because it was like well shit, i got all of this time now how am i going to move now that i'm not underneath this umbrella so to speak and i had to you know kind of get adjusted and i had started a management company while i was at slip and slide and was doing that on the side so it's not like i was completely in the dark um, but I spent that first year or two just kind of trying to figure out how I was going to move independently. And ultimately I just, I started, um, I started shopping records for multiple people. And, um, I, I guess even as I'm sharing the experience now, I was in that space because I was managing somebody actively in Miami and, um, after I got them their first placement as TI record, um, my first single placement, TI's I'm Back. It was like the first record he dropped when he got out of prison. Um, my producers did that record. And long story short, as soon as I signed them a, a deal for them, like I get this cease and desist letter in the mail from some other management company. And these guys didn't even have the courtesy to call me. They didn't have it, you know, so it was like, I think that was my first official uh, rape <laughs> in the biz, wow. you know, where I put somebody in this position, like, you know, I made all the plays happen, made the deal happen, placed the record, made him, you know, got him a publishing deal. And it was like, I guess I did that for somebody else. Um, so behind that and that being the client that I, I managed, like, you know, loss can be devastating. So I remember thinking for a while, I didn't want to manage um, so I had this manage 
this management skill set. I had a and R skill set, a producer skill set. And I ended up ultimately fusing these skill sets, you know, as I moved and figured things out being in LA. So I was, initially I was just kind of uh, consulting for creatives and taking their records and, and shopping them with the majors. I had relationships with the majors. Um, I did that for a while and then just really got more focused as I saw a few other situations happen where loyalty became an issue. Um, I got more focused on developing my team. I uh, got over, my, you know, being butthurt about, you know, getting screwed and, and said, okay, let's dive back in and um, took another stab at management. And, you know, I was still working with creatives actively, um, but within that second year, my, um, one of the guys on my team, we ended up getting a huge record, Pitbull's Timber. And that was like, you know, they, they have this saying in the biz, like if one hit record will change your life. And that was, that was one of those moments. It was definitely one of those moments. Um, that was maybe 2013, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And I moved to LA April 1st, 2011. So it was like within those first two years, I have the, the number one record in the world. Like yeah. this was a smash at billboard number one, yeah. you know, and, um, I got fucked behind that record too. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I had paperwork, you know, and and that was like that that play was like that moment that I can always trace back to when I decided I would never do another deal without an attorney involved. Period. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been rocking with the same attorney since, and you know she's incredible. Mm -hmm. But I got screwed, and I st and it's still I, I didn't get completely screwed. But my initial deal, like I should have been, I would have been very good, very good. And instead, um, they just tried to, it was one of those, it's one of those tricky situations, man, um, where that's, that was kind of like my first introduction to some of the, the some of the uh, racially motivated, motivated, um, you know, things that you would experience in the biz that, weren't so blatant, you know, but you just knew, you felt it, and then you start hearing things in the biz, and you, you notice the reputations, and you know, it's like certain companies, they're notorious for Xing people out of the equation. Um, wow. And this was a company, like, I, I, it was so much to the fact that when I signed the deal, and I already knew to expect some something was gonna come in. And when I tell you, like, this company, now, I signed I signed my client to a major publishing deal and then they came in and managed him as well like they you know ultimately bought me out of my management yeah. but I mean this is a conflict of interest off top like you're being published and managed by the same company mm -hmm. um, so it's just you know stuff like that where you see and it's coming from the label side you know what I'm saying not like these are cats that are very you know you can you can influence a young creative you dangle a little carrot, you know what I'm saying? Dangle a little opportunity, a, a placement. And these are the kind of things that you see happen um, just on some divide and conquer shit. Um, so it's like, that was the experience, huge record. But behind that, I was able to take what I received from this, from this buyout. And this is the point where I started focusing on my art. This is, um, I... <clears throat> I started focusing on it, but moving here to LA period is when art actually began. It, you know, it, I, I realized it was, it should be more than a hobby. Within that first year, people were seeing old stuff I did in high school mm -hmm. and were just like, you should be doing something with your, something with your art. Yeah. And after, you know, hearing that a few times, I was like, okay, God, I hear you. So I made the conscious decision of January 1st, 2012 less than a year after I moved here to start pursuing art seriously. So I'm, you know, I'm backing up a little bit just to set that there because ultimately once Timber hit, I was in a space where I was, I was dedicating myself to pursuing art seriously. And just to show you how rewarding the universe was. I mean, I said that January 1st, 2012, 
that same month I had my first gallery, my first legit gallery exhibition. Mm. So that let me know like, okay, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And Timber was a test on multiple levels because it put me in a position where I got this lump sum check where, okay, I don't have to necessarily you know, do art at all. I don't have to do, you know, hypothetically, I could just sit here and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Let me see, what is most important to me? Am I gonna, am I really in love with music like I was? And it, I guess the combination of everything I've experienced in music with, uh, you know, you add on top of that, the number of people that you encounter that just don't have the work ethic, you know, incredibly talented, but no work ethic. And that will get you nowhere, you know, it will get you absolutely nowhere in the biz. Um, so I, well, you know, once I got that, that, that buyout, I made a decision at that point that I was going to pursue art that much more seriously. I was actually going to dedicate my time, my day in, day out mm -hmm. to building and developing my art practice and getting my art career to a point where it was paying the bills um, instead of music. And that's kind of like where the ball, that's the initial push of the ball. And literally was living off of, um, you know, that check and was still doing music stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't my day to day 24 seven. Whereas prior to that, I was, I mean, I was in, I was in a major space weekly. I had, you know, meetings almost daily or we sitting down and it was just like, why? You know, like, let me do something like, like, let me dive into something I'm passionate about. And, um, yeah, it's been an incredible, incredible ride since just getting the 10,000 hours in. And it was important for me, um, especially not being from LA. I feel like, I feel like people born and raised here in LA have a, a crazy advantage over anybody in the world just because the nature of this city mm -hmm. and the relationships that you can establish. So knowing that I've always had this like chip um this 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 flame lit underneath me like oh you got to play catch up to the people that were born and raised here mm -hmm. um so it's just been in go mode just being in every show possible always creating um and that's what's been happening over the past 10 years just me manifesting and bringing that to life and in the process you know it's like i'm i just have an inc insane work ethic like i don't know a lot of people that are going to work um, hard and have the talent, mm -hmm. which I've experienced so much just being in management. Like most of the time people have that, that they're talented. They just don't have the work ethic. Either they feel like they don't need it or they just lack it, you know? And that's something that's got me to everything I've accomplished. I've been blessed to accomplish has just been behind that work ethic, yeah. knowing how important that is. And, um, like I said, just spending this time developing, the art and at the same time still keeping a hand in music because I, I love music. It's just the bullshit. It's the business that I hate and I still hate it to this day. So I'm, you know, I, I will jokingly say like I got one toe in the biz. Like that's, that's it. One toe. You're not really going to get more from me at this point. Cause I've done like, I'd love to have another, you know, another number one, but a billboard number one, um, single, let me say, because I had a Billboard number one album last year. You know, we went quadruple platinum with, with NCT 127. So it's like, even as what I really noticed is, is that after I made the decision of kind of pulling away and pulling back from music where I wasn't as, as proactive in, in everybody's face as I was, that's really when the blessings, the really bigger blessings started to come. Like that's like K-pop happened within that space. Like I think I started in K-pop around 2015. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had a good like four year run. Um, and even that, like the only reason that stopped is fuckery, business fuckery. Mm -hmm. I had a business partner who tried to, he tried, tried to blackball mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. us in Korea because he, he was upset because I was featured in, in Billboard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. 
And I'm, I'm glad you're touching on all this because through this journey, we've been granted the opportunity to teach kids both film and music, and they are absolutely clueless to the industry. And like, I hope that they watch and see this and get some insight. But I want to hear from you. What type of advice? You talked about your attorney, but what other <clears throat> advice would you have for someone who's set on the music industry, how to protect themselves? Oh, man, off top attorney. I can't stress that again uh, enough. Making sure an attorney and and even like let's say the timber deal, I had a like a somewhat attorney, like I had a consultant that I was working with, and it's like my ass wasn't even covered. You know, it's like when I think when I look back and put it in perspective of like, okay, I could have spent two hundred dollars or whatever the co the cost was to make sure I had a soundproof contract versus me getting screwed out of. You know, <laughs> how do you want to, you know, it's like mm -hmm. obscene amounts of money. It's like, it's a no brainer at that time, you know, in those moments, like I, I've been a starving artist. Like I know it's, it's a different decision in that moment. Yeah. You're like, you're trying to cut corners, but certain things you can't cut corners on. And I would recommend like, you know, anything legal, do not cut corners. Um, Hustle, you know, hustle harder than anybody in the room at all points. Yeah. Um, you know, consistent quality is just so important to me, period. You know, the work ethic is highly important, but you need to make sure your shit is the best at all times. You know what I'm saying? And that, I think, is just very important. I think quality's kind of been placed on the back burner for a lot of mm -hmm. <laughs> creative outlets. Um, you know, develop your, just develop your base, you know, develop your, your community, your community and make sure it stays strong. I mean, it's, it's so different. Like it's been interesting because I've been a part of, you know, the world before it was so reliant on the internet and online. Like when I was initially grinding as a musician, as an artist, the internet was still so new and it was like when you were dropping stuff you were dropping stuff with cd baby and like mm -hmm. you know like it, it's just like the process has come a long way and it's much easier much easier now um so i mean just just do your research there's so much information out there you know like read those books everything you need to know about the music business like do your homework because this is a business. I think that's the biggest thing that people <clears throat> will lose sight of or don't really have a great understanding of like, oh, I'm just rapping like, nah, this is a business and you need mm -hmm. to move like that every single step of the way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Period. Like what you're putting out there, this is you, this is your brand. You know, you are the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like nowadays, a lot of artists that I run into, like you said, have the talent, but don't have the work ethic. But on top of that, they lack the business knowledge. So they think of it like, I'm just gonna rap so good, I'm gonna make a single so hot that somebody's gonna come pick me up. And I feel like that's a wrong mentality to have. Like, you need to, be, you need to learn how to shop it. <laughs> and you need to know how to network and you need to be able to speak to people. If you can't do that, then somebody needs to be doing that on your behalf. So artists out there, <laughs> hey, that's, that's my tip from the outside looking in because I'm not in the industry. Look, to be honest, you need to be able to do that mm -hmm. in this day. Like you, you can't even really get somebody else to do certain things. You know, it's like you bringing a certain skill set to the table is the difference between you being successful and not. Yeah. Period. Especially in this day and age because there's so many artists that that will. There's so many whack ass artists that will come run circles around you. You know what I'm saying? And your work mm -hmm. ethic which is crazy, you know, so. Yeah, I got a question for you. So did the quality and the quantity of your work change once you got paid from that placement with Pitbull? Like, was there like a sense of freedom to allow you to create better or were you creating different art from stress financially or anything like that? Well, artistically, I was still trying to really discover my voice that early in my career. Um, I had the understanding of I had the understanding of how important it was to have a voice, just from what I've done in music and with working with producers. Um, so I was looking 
you know, actively trying to find something that that connected. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing. It, it gave me the freedom to do that. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I didn't have to be creating ultimately to make sure that somebody was gonna buy this to put the lights on. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like and ironically, like I'm I'm known for two different bodies of work. This is what I'm known for in like the fine art world. And this body of work, like this style has taken me so much longer to kind of embed in people's heads and and, and you know understand like this is it's not a painting like it's or it's not a collage it's fully painted by hand you know there's just different levels to that and it just takes that time um of just you know consistently showing up um whereas you know with my like my celebrity icon series that i do with like you know venus serena williams mm -hmm. um it's like it's more digestible you know what i'm saying it's like there's no thought as from a you know from the viewer's perspective it's like okay if you have an appreciation for this person that person you love color like it's gonna connect um so it's i've definitely been in situations where it's it like i'm in a space now where i can come you know create the things that i want to um but at that time, I, I can't say it necessarily impacted it directly. It gave me that space to find my voice. Um, but in a general sense, just your finances always, I think they almost always <laughs> impact the space that you're oh, in yeah. as a creator. You know, mm -hmm. for, the, for the good majority of my life, I've been a struggling artist. Yeah. That's what I can say. You know, uh, Timber, like I use that moment ironically to dive into that lifestyle of of being a you know a struggling artist like i wasn't literally struggling but it was like i'm going to focus all my time on creating i'm not going to stress about yeah. generating new new you know what i'm saying because mm -hmm. this is what i need to be doing um which i think more than served this purpose you know i don't think i'd be here right now having this conversation mm -hmm. if i hadn't done that you know and or been in a position to do that yeah. i might still you know not to say I, I'd, I'd probably have so much more involvement in music, you know, mm -hmm. who knows? It just wouldn't be what it is now. Me and him were having a good conversation before, like on the way to the airport, you know, I was reading a book, Think and Grow Rich, and it was talking about, you know, having that burning desire, like what really drives you. And I was telling him like, man, I kind of lost a little bit of my drive because I've been grinding so hard at like the video stuff and I feel like, finances and 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 plans have like corrupted my mental space to create and i'm like so i'm just curious to know like what is your like desire like what is your what drives you because you could have stopped on multiple c scenarios like you got the hit record or and vice versa like somebody screwed you over but you kept going like what what is the driving force to keep you grinding like you are? Because you're still hungry to this day, mm -hmm. still grinding. Mm -hmm. um, man, I'm destined for greatness. I, I, I come from, I feel like I come from an era where like to be considered great or a legend, like you, you were definitely putting in work mm -hmm. to obtain an accolade like that. Now, you know, it's kind of, it's tossed around loosely. But I come from that era and, um, you know, it's like, if you're going to do something, you got to be the best at it. That's like, that's the mentality that, that I try to keep in mind. I just, I want to be like, I know I'm fucking ill. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how blessed I am. I know who God created. And until the world knows that I got work to do. You know what I'm saying? And that's really what it boils down to. Like, I'm like, greatness inspires me. Even seeing other people achieve greatness, like, that always inspires me. So, you know, I want to continue. I just want to be able to inspire others um, through just, you know, leading by example. And that's, I got a lot of work to do. You know what I'm saying? I think I'm, I'm realistic. I think bigger than anything, I'm realistic with myself. And I know that no matter what I've achieved, what I've accomplished, nobody's ever really seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, there's no way in the world you could really reach every single person in this world. Mm -hmm. 
so that leaves an opportunity to reach new people you know so it's like i just have no matter i i, I don't think i'll ever let you know success get to my head yeah. because i'm very much a realist mm -hmm. you know where it's like mm, but what have you really done you know what i'm saying what and it all boils down to what you're doing at the same time you know i don't mm -hmm. i never want to be one of those people that just oh man back in high school i was that you know <laughs> i was the dude you know like, yeah. what are you doing now <laughs> right 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 uh, i gotta thank you for that 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 right there that's yeah. what i've been missing that that edge he has right there <laughs> no, that was no. good perspective how you yeah. really, really because i sat down and you know, after we had that conversation on the way to the airport and then we had a layover in Seattle and I was really thinking deeply from what I just asked you, like, what is it that I like want to do? Like, why did I leave so many jobs and opportunities to keep pursuing what I love to do? And I'm like, I just want to be great. <laughs> and, you know, I just I think that's what I have to get back to is like I need to be the best at what I'm doing. And I feel like I have been in the past, but it wasn't like a conscious like. I'm going to take over. And, you know, so I thank you for that. My pleasure. I love the city of Los Angeles. The energy there promotes creativity. Coming from Ohio, Creativity is not safe. It's not a place where creative industry thrives. People move out to the West Coast here in America to, to feel safe, to feel that they can express themselves and also earn a living doing so. The conversation was so real. There was so much synergy and so much value being given that we decided to continue the conversation. We literally had a whole moment that what I was kind of alluding to, like when she when she cropped this piece. Mm -hmm. It was such a like I have pictures, you know, like I have part of it captured. It was just such an, a powerful emotional moment where she broke down, like fully really broke did. down, mm -hmm. like boohoo crying in a, in the middle of a of a gallery. Thankfully, it was just a private showing, so it was just like me, her, and the gallery Which owner. Which was a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I literally was like bent over, like my my face was like in my hands and i was just like bawling because one it's a beautiful piece but then to like i'm from birmingham alabama like i moved here with 300 dollars to my name so to be able to go to a private showing with an artist that i absolutely admire and adore who now is also a friend like and to see this beautiful piece and then to call it my own what is life you know like what really what is life so it was like that entire moment just all hit me at once of like what i had overcome to get here and then like getting into a space of saying i would love to like i just love art and then graduating to i'm a whole collector like you know again black female from alabama getting into the art world and being a collector and the work just being so beautiful it just and now, like, every time he gives me something or I see his, like, it's always a moment of just breaking down. Wow. Yeah. Was it just strictly the piece or was it a little bit of the meaning behind the piece? Did you know anything about what it meant? It was definitely, um, it was definitely the, the meaning behind it as well. Because when I think about, like, the piece imperfection, and just like, I mean, especially moving out here, sometimes you feel like you do have to be perfect and you feel like you're not accepted if you don't kind of morph yourself into what this industry or, you know, L.A. wants you to be. But just kind of seeing the peace in like the beauty of this, like it's just there's something in the peace of kind of recognizing your own perfection. And I think that for me is what you know, I really took away from it is like, yes, there's so much beauty in here, but even just like recognizing your own perfection. Um, but it also, it just like, this piece has been like therapy for me. So even in the gallery, like the tear, <laughs> like there's just something like, I always tell him, I'm like that dang tear, I'm not being <laughs> girls on here, but 
I always like it's it's just it's it's very very powerful. Um, the piece is very much alive and has. I know it sounds crazy, but like kind of shifts depending on where I've been in life as far as how I see it and how I see it seeing me. Um, and it's just a very, very powerful experience for that piece to have been sitting in my small apartment in Burbank on the floor. I had nowhere, like I bought the piece and I had nowhere to put it. So I would definitely tell people like if you're collecting and you see something, especially if it's like within your means to get it and you know that like art appreciates I mean, this was the first piece that he made that was this large. It was beautiful. I loved it. I bought it and I had nowhere to put it. But I was like, well, I want to move eventually. So when I moved, like I actually ended up having to find a place that had a wall big enough to, you know, fit this piece. So there are just so many things that go into it. But, you know, it sat there on my floor and it looked it almost looked very different than than now, like. I think I told you, I was like, I just, I feel like she just respects me so much. Like she has her own wall. She has her <laughs> own space. Like it's just, it's just, it's such a vibe, such a vibe. But all his work is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what inspired you to, like, what does art mean to you? Because you easily could have not hung all like custom art around your home. Like yeah. you could have got some stuff from Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> like what does art mean to you why is it important for you to have these pieces around because you got some, some some really dope stuff here. thank you thank you so much um <laughs> <laughs> you know shout out to vaccine for you know my art addiction to his work um i mean honestly it's it's therapy it is peace um i think you had taken some pictures of the venus and serena piece um but he actually, there was another like crying moment um, where he sent me to print. Was it for the holidays? Yeah. Um, so that's another thing. Like you collect, you become a loyal collector, like of an artist that is a gracious and kind human being. They will typically, you know, like give gift you certain things. And so he gifted me these, I think it was three prints. Um, and it was actually around a time where I was struggling like mental health wise, like probably one of the lowest points of my life. And like, like I'm almost about to cry now, just remembering. But he sent me these two prints and like the Venus and Serena print, I looked at it and I just immediately burst into like joyful tears. And that was like the first time, <sighs> sorry, in a while um, that I had just felt so much joy. And so like being able to like, I'm so sorry, <laughs> being able to hang, you know, a piece that he had given me and a print that he had given me in my home that's like now right in the front door. So it's like I walk in and I'm immediately joyful. So like that's, I mean, this is what art is for me. It's therapy, it's healing, it's cleansing. Um, and it calls me out on my shit. Like, again, sorry if I can't cuss, but it really does. Like it, it forces me to deal with parts of myself that sometimes I feel like we might suppress. Um, so it's just, it's a very, very powerful thing for me. So I'm very intentional. Um, like even this piece over here um, that wasn't insecure, like to me, it reminds me of my journey coming to uh, LA you know and it's the butterfly and it's like the birth and all of those things so it literally reminds me of my evolution of coming here and being this little caterpillar and it was just so tough and i'm fighting to get out and then all of a sudden i come out and i'm this butterfly so it's very all of it is very very intentional like i don't i don't buy art that i don't like i don't buy art for the sake of like oh this is this is an artist that they're, you know, people say they're so renowned and all those things and like the value is going to sky. Like I don't buy art because of someone else's perceived value. I buy the art that I like and I love and the art that really resonates with me. The, the title of the piece is The Peace in Perfection and the solo show was The Peace in Perfection and it was, um, and my, although my work is cohesive to the point where it celebrates um, women, 
you know, women at the at the rawest form. It's just a celebration of women and um, you know the beautiful details, um, the the imperfections that that make every woman incredible. You know, to me, God is, uh, you know, his greatest creation is woman. So I choose to celebrate women in my work. Um, and this piece is just, it's beyond special. Just kind of, uh, it's, for me, it's like the moment, the space I was in when I was creating this piece. Um, I was going through a divorce. I was like in the middle of a, a toxic divorce and I had just lost my dad um probably like a year prior so and then on top of that i just had my son um so there were just a mixture of emotions um it was one of the heaviest points of my life and it's something that still you know impacts me to this day um but what i can say is that i'm grateful i'm always beyond grateful for just the power of art because art saved my life then it saves my life every single day um and i was one, at this point in my life where i was just so low somehow some way i was able to um just kind of spill that energy on the canvas and that's something that i always try to do just put all of myself into my work um and i think it just really transferred well like this piece specifically just represents um you know the chaos like everything that we go through in pursuit of um acceptance or, or um perfection if you will out here in sunny los angeles very beautiful day um you just explained the meaning of that piece to me and that added so much value, more value. Not that it was, wasn't a great piece, but just the meaning behind your creation just added a lot more value to what it is you do, man. And it's crazy how life works. I'm just trying to connect and relate. Um, I went through a lot of trials and tribulations when I started higher faculty. And it was like at a time where I was going through a crazy breakup as well and a lot of drama but through all of that i found peace in creating and um overall i think that's the the purpose of of this is to help people find their voice creatively and for these conversations to be like a safe place for people like because mm-hmm. um, we're all human we all go through things and down the road i see you know people watching this and viewing this and just getting understanding like some of the things you go through as a creator so um i appreciate that explanation so it's real though let me just add in um i was having an interesting conversation about what we go through as creators recently and um i was sharing how i think create as creators like we're some of the most tortured souls on this planet Mm -hmm. for whatever reason it's like we have to go we have to experience pure hell and then in return we're able to convert that into something beautiful you know to share with the world and um it's just so you hear that consistently like as artists you know what you go through you know what i'm saying i know what i've been through and i've definitely been to hell and back and um just every you know when you hear so many different artist stories you're like damn yeah that's not the regular struggle you know yeah and it's crazy you say that because i think our society as a whole like doesn't reward creativity it does like at the top like when you see the final product but i was For example, this morning I was walking down Venice Beach and I bumped into a guy. He has some crazy, beautiful artwork. I don't know him personally, but he looked a little rough around the edges like he was either painting or something before that (laughs) or just. And I just seen like the grind from just looking at him. And I'm like, 
you know, here you are in Venice Beach hustling, grinding, and I see like genius coming through your paintbrush. And I feel like now more than ever, there, there's opportunity for artists to earn a living, you know, through doing what they do. And um, I want you to talk about your journey as, I mean, you kind of already touched on it. You know, you took that leap to create, but what are some tips for people who are artists now on, you know, how to essentially be an artist for a living? Um, the biggest key, period, is just understanding the importance of having multiple streams of revenue. Yeah. Like that's everything. Mm -hmm. If you're coming into whatever field you're in, if you rap, if you paint, if you dance, if, no matter what you do, no, you know, like you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So for me as a painter, you know, I think traditionally artists just had, oh, you do a painting, you're going to get paid for a painting. You do prints, you'll get paid for that. Yeah. When I came into, mind you, coming into the art from a music business background, I had no knowledge of the art world whatsoever. The only thing I knew was how to be successful in entertainment and music specifically. But it's like if you could survive in music and, you know, entertainment, that's that that transfers across all genres. And I literally just apply the same tactics I would as if I was releasing, you know, be like a music artist releasing. So mm -hmm. it's like coming in, I have, you know, merch, like I've, and I've always been from early in my artist career, like I've had merch available, just different options, things that, you know, it's like, let's just say art. Somebody might love this painting, but they might still be in the process of discovering what kind of art to have in their home. But Everybody wears shirts. Everybody, you know, uses bags. Just more tangible items for everyday use. Yeah. And it's just you, you know, like, it's necessary because if I had to rely solely on painting, I would have been broke a long time ago. Because you have to put those 10,000 hours in. You have to get your work to a point where people want to buy it. And then you got to get these prices to the point where, you know, it can... You know, it grows and you're able to survive, you know, yeah. which is, that's a lot because you got to invest back into yourself, you know, mm -hmm. like that's, that's huge. That's definitely key. Investing in yourself. Um, man, just, you got to, you know, you got to be your number one fan at all times. You got to believe in yourself when literally nobody else believes yeah, I can think of so many days where, you know, it's like, why am I doing this? Nobody cares. The only it, it doesn't matter who else cares as long as you care. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you just got to be passionate about what you're doing. And you can't tiptoe into it. If this is what you want to do. You know, like you got to go above and beyond to figure out how to make that happen. And, you know, like. That biggest thing off top, like I said, is those multiple streams. What those multiple streams look like for you, like, you know, that's subjective. That's extremely subjective. And that's where the creativity shows up. Yeah. You know, I do merch, but I also, um, you know, I've been working at NFTs. Like, that's a whole different stream of revenue. Like, there's multiple streams of revenue for almost anybody that is a creator. Yeah. You know, if you're a musician, you got your records that... You know, you might be working with artists for set projects. You might be working on placement stuff. You might be working on TV film stuff. You're going to have your hands in different things because you never know what's going to pop, um, you know, ultimately. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, I, I say that, but I also want to add, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. Yeah. But, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's some balance that's, that you have to find. And it really just comes down to you defining how you want to operate like what do you want your ideal day to look like because i've been living that for the past year uh you know we do youtube and then we started doing twitch and mm -hmm. then we had a patreon and then we started selling merch and then i sell myself as a service so i'm like right. okay right all these streams of income but what's it's it's sometimes when you get in that in that uh flow it's like how do you determine where should I spend my hours sometimes? And it's like, you can be pulled into a lot of directions, but um, you know, 
ultimately you have to find what brings you the most happiness, I think, in my opinion. And, you know, if that's actual art, then that's where the majority should go. And then, you know, you find ways to complement things together. Like while you're doing your art, you're promoting on social media and, you know, you, you post it on different platforms. So I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, talk, talk to me about the NFT space. I'm kind of relatively new. I understand the blockchain and, 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 and that type of technology. But what has that done to you? What made you jump into the NFT space? Um, well, I was presented the opportunity early in the game. Um, I, my, for the most part, all of my NFTs are available on Maker's Place, which is like one of the premier platforms for NFTs. And they, like some of the top execs there, reached out to me mid-2018. And at the time, they were just presenting an idea. And um, I had no clue what they were talking about. but. You know, as a creator, especially as a producer, like my job, everything I do is to be in tune with what's happening and what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? So I like to consider myself always kind of tapped in. Mm -hmm. So when I heard, I was just like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds like it's going to be the wave at some point. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, all right, cool. There's no, no risk involved on my end. What do I have to lose? This was the end of 2018 and started slowly um, making sales like over the, the first year. I think um, like 2019, they, like towards the end of that year, they were they had picked up definitely the sales. And then 2020 hit COVID, like it changed the game. Like I think that's when, when crypto really took off in general because everybody's, you know, on house arrest at home, yeah. quarantined to, to the confinement of their these walls and, it's like, all right, let's figure it out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so when you got things going crazy, like I think it just brought a whole set of new eyes because I can, sh I can share like top of 20, 2021. I mean, I sold a piece, like a piece this Michael Jordan edition that sold for, I want to say it sold for eight ETH, mm -hmm. which at the time was like around like 20k something like that yeah and for me like just i mean that was and that wasn't the first big that was like the biggest purchase but prior to that i had some things like that just sh gave me a glimpse of like oh this is this is happening you know yeah. what i'm saying but that moment was just like such a powerful moment um on so many levels because it's like I'm selling my work like I'm selling physical paintings yeah and have been for the past 10 years and here I've just made in one transaction the most I've made for one body of work um, yeah. all at once and it was for a digit for a J you know a JPEG yeah of my work mm -hmm. so it's not even it wasn't even the physical piece you know so it was just um, it's kind of mind blowing, you know, it's incredible, incredible blessing. Um, NFTs just changed everything mm -hmm. about like it, you know, I, I view it as an additional stream, but it was an additional stream that was so unexpected. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of artists convert their whole practice to just focusing a hundred percent on NFTs just because it's crazy people are just kind of throwing money left and right and everybody wants to be involved mm -hmm. and you know it's it's definitely the future mm -hmm. for sure we're very very early in it um but even this early just i think being involved and you know being considered like an og in the nft space like i've been blessed to you know have a lot of supporters in that space yeah. which is completely different from like the traditional world collectors yeah. like you know my collector the the, the collector the space we're in now she doesn't own nfts she doesn't necessarily want to own nfts but has a home full of physical art you know so it's just like not only an additional stream and an additional audience you know additional eyes and and supporters that maybe not wouldn't be exposed to your work in a different you yeah. know scenario so how do you go about <clears throat> making 
your work into an nft do you like take a picture of it or do you scan it with like a scanner and then upload it like how does that process even work well i mean my physical work like a painting like this all of my physical work when i finish painting it mm -hmm. i take it to um i work with a company here that handles all of my photography for my art so mm -hmm. like if you were to buy a print from me it's it's based on an image a high-res image of the actual painting Okay. And the company I work with, like the, the images I get from them are just so incredible. I've had my work featured on billboards mm -hmm. and it's pristine. Like if you look at the print file of this painting, it looks exactly like what you're seeing in person. Yeah. So that quality is there, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And um, it just, you know, it's like, just gives the work legs. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're able to reach that man, that many more people. Okay, interesting. I'm hope I'm hoping people are taking value from this, man. Um, so, as far as exhibiting your art, how did you? You talked about some of the skills that you use, like from being an A and R and in the music industry, like promoting, you know, artists. How? Talk to me about how those things kind of correlate together when you have a drop. So do you have like a, a release type party or are you like inviting people? Um, how does a drop of yours happen? Um, it depends. I mean, I've done most of the stuff, I think historically through my career, um, most of the stuff has been partnered with another gallery. Yeah. And when it's partnered with another gallery, it's like, it's like, it's, yeah, it's my show, but there's somebody else involved. So they have a say, um, the ironically just coming into COVID, I was in a space where I was moving away from showing with galleries. Um, just cause I've reached a, a, a space in my career where I was bringing the collectors to the table, the galleries are still eating and just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I even opened behind NFTs and crypto. I was able to open my own gallery last year. Um, got it at the beginning of the last year. And um, unfortunately I had like the landlord ended up switching and you know, I, I lost my space because they ended up moving into, the new landlord ended up moving into the space. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just the opportunities that, that are open, you know, for me as an artist and where I was headed, you know, where I'm headed now is like putting on my own shows. Mm -hmm. Like the last show I had was the grand opening of my gallery. Um, so as it pertains to the question, like what does a drop look like that? You know, if, if it's something where it's a special moment, like the grand opening, even prior to that, my last major show was a solo show. Mm -hmm. um, these are moments where if it's all my work, I'm going in. Yeah. In. Like there's gonna be a vibe, there's gonna be a party element. I used to um I used to like throw these house parties and so it's like entertaining is kind of in my in my blood. So I love to just yeah. make sure people look good and it's like I got my art up. You know, it's a, it's just a whole vibe. Like everybody's there to celebrate me. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I, I I work with an amazing, amazing chef. Mm -hmm. My friend Fabi out in Florida, like she flies in like the last three or four major shows I've had, she'll fly in and we'll work together where she'll create these desserts that feature my art on them. And yeah. it's everything's completely edible. Um, so it's like when I'm when I do a drop, I'm trying to make sure that anybody that comes out to support me is going to experience something mm -hmm. that impacts their life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like a life-changing moment. Yeah. Like you're going to remember this show, period. That's deep. Even the edible art, you know, like you don't go to shows. You, you, it's something I haven't seen at any other show, mm -hmm. period. So it's just about like, I'm always willing to take that extra step just to make sure that that experience for a supporter is there or potential supporter. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it varies with each release. Mm -hmm. But I always want to make sure it's special. You know, there's um, even with like my NFTs, like I'll pair physical items with the NFTs. So it's just like, how much value can I add and give to people that are supporting me and showing love? That's the way to do it. Even outside of like just this painting, like that's how you, you know, shop your 
craft period is create an experience mm -hmm. uh shout out to uh virgil of blow man he, i listened to him talk a, a few times you know after his passing i wasn't too familiar with his work you know while i was here i got seen off white and everything but i was listening to him talk about art and he was like he had some type of item i can't remember but he was like put this next to um you know trash and it's just an ordinary item but if you put this in a contemporary art gallery it, the value changes mm -hmm. and you know i find that very interesting like art in a space becomes it has different it holds different value how you present it you know even the place that we're in this is a nice place you know shout out to the owner and the art just it fits it, it complements the space you know as i look around it's just adding more value to you know where we're sitting so art is art is dope it's mm -hmm. beautiful it's beautiful. very long term what is your where do you see yourself in the next like as you get into like retirement like what's the long term end goal for vaccine and his art and his legacy um I will be considered one of the greats, one of the great artists, period. Not just black artists, you know, like one of the greats, one of the all time greats. Um, I want my work everywhere. I want my work in as many homes as possible. Um, I just, uh, uh, you know, bigger than anything, I want to make sure that my son is good. Like, I want to make sure that I'm leaving legacy behind and just leaving a, a positive legacy and um you know behind for him to just be in a different space and take our take our 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 dna to a whole different venue you know just changing changing direction and um just inspiring people you know inspiring us making sure people that that look like me look like us know that any and everything is possible yeah. um I think that's key, and I, I'm, I, I think I just let my actions speak for itself, you know. Yeah, that's important. That's important. You know, if you said that and I and and, and the work wasn't being put in, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be different. But I see you putting in the work. Um, I actually skipped a question. I wanted to ask you about your work being featured in Shameless. Oh, Insecure. I'm sorry. I just got that completely wrong. Insecure. No words. <laughs> um, Insecure, um, man, that, that's been a huge blessing, a huge, huge blessing. Um, this is a, she's a fan of my work. They, they reached out. Like what I love about Asa and the show is like, she's so authentic with everything she's doing down to the art. Like the first time I placed work on Insecure and I've had work featured on the past three seasons. Um, and the first time the opportunity was presented as she wants black work by black artists specifically. Mm -hmm. And that just like, you just don't get that in the biz from anywhere. I don't care who it is, you know what I'm saying? So like that set a tone, it was like, okay, mm -hmm. I love this, you know? And there was that, the, the first placement happened. And honestly, it was a, it's like when placements happen, like you're gonna get paid before it comes out. So mm -hmm. I got paid, but then you never know if it's going to actually make it on screen. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I got paid and it actually didn't even air that season. It didn't even, my work didn't even air for another year. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I won't say I forgot about it, but it was just like, oh, well, all right. I got, you know, I got the bag. So whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I was just sitting there watching it because I'm a fan. I love the show. I was just like, oh shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And then. And it's like, that was the first time. And I have a piece featured in her bathroom. So this is like a main, I mean, she's rapping in the bathroom like almost every episode, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's not just feature, like I'm getting these prominent features. Um, mm -hmm. That was the first one. The second one, um, I had a piece like when, when Issa and, and um, Lawrence got, got back together after they broke up and they went to the art walk and they stopped and uh, I'm sitting there watching the show again. Mm -hmm had received the check. I'm sitting there watching it. And then they stop and have a damn conversation about my art. Like they literally stop and have a whole dialogue yeah. about the work. 
Florence is like, ah, I don't fuck with it, which was hilarious. You know what I'm saying? Because Issa was like, nah, I, you know, I love this. Yeah. And explain why. Uh -huh. So it was just like, it's like, yo, you could, to have your work featured is just an honor in itself. Yeah. But to have it featured and then included within the dialogue, like on one of the top black shows, period. Mm -hmm. One of the top shows on television, you know, it was just surreal moments, surreal, surreal moments. And then last season, um, my Kobe piece was featured in a barbershop scene, like mm -hmm. very prominent scene as well. Um, and then just, you know, you got multiple looks of the bathroom scene. So just relationships to answer the question, relationships, mm -hmm. um, relationships. Yeah. Off top. The first the first time it was presented was a relationship. And funny enough, that person tried to screw me mm -hmm. by taking 50% of that deal, mm -hmm. um, which is just like, why, why would you, you know what I'm saying? Like even a manager would get 20%. Mm -hmm. So they screwed, screwed me out of that first one, but it worked out in my favor because Insecure had to come back to me directly mm -hmm. after that because they love my work. And then um, fast forward to like this year where I think this year is where, like I knew they appreciated my work, but isa has been doing stuff on her own and she just curated this, um, this Airbnb for the Super Bowl mm -hmm. in LA where like, you know, it was like a contest or something like that. But in this Airbnb, she curated her favorite artist and my work was featured, you know? So I'm just like, okay, so she really fucks with me, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. relationships and, um, I think even better just having some having strong work you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying it's like having a relationship is one thing but having something that was that she connected with you know yeah i i, I couldn't predict that but mm -hmm. that's just the universe aligning things wow yeah so do you look to do more of that in the future do you like is that something like featured on like your website like about you is like you know i'm a i don't know what you would even call that like a featured um, I mean, it's just TV. They're just licensing plays at the end of the day. People, yeah. you know, they're licensing my work to feature it, TV film. Um, mm -hmm. That's just one of the more prominent looks. I've, I've actually been blessed in that space and I'm very blessed. Um, I mean, my work was on Snowfall last season. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are like, it's not like it's just random in the background. Yeah. Like my, and, and the work is so bold. Like, that's one thing. The work like my work is very distinct. You're not gonna see anything that looks like it. And when you see it, it stands out. Mm -hmm. So even Snowfall, I got all these, I didn't even know it was featured in Snowfall. I got all these DMs of like, yo, I saw your work on Snowfall. And I'm like, nah, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause mind you, we get a check and, and funny enough, we get those checks and it, it might just say a company on it. Yeah. So I, you know, most of the time I'll have to Google what that company is to see what you know, I'm like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is what they're doing, but this is what they're working on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got those calls and then I, you know, I finally watched that episode and it was just, just a huge look. It's like my piece was front and center in this, you know, mm -hmm. crazy scene. Um, my work's been featured in, in Dave. I mean, I, I, I just got four new placements last week. Like I'm in a blessed situation where the company I work with, that that helps me get those placements. Like mm -hmm. they love my work. That's, that's super dope. I have to go back and check out that snowfall episode. Cause I'm, oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the show Yeah. and I was watching it before I was familiar with the work. So I have to go back and do my homework. Um, yeah. And the, and the fact that it's Ray loves your stuff too, man, that's huge too. Um, she started off on like YouTube, I believe, mm -hmm. like way back when. I remember my sister like hilariously just cracking up to her like in 2014, 2015. And I'm like, wow, you know, the power of being a creator is real now. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you can go from, you know, your at home and to the big screen so i think that's the beauty of now like with tech not the, the way technology is crazy now you literally see mm -hmm. things that like you know things that will inspire you like i can only imagine how even seeing isa do that you know what i'm saying is inspiring for you yeah, oh yeah it's just like 
We were just watching her on YouTube, and now she's mm -hmm. fucking everywhere. She's all over the world. You know, one of the biggest stars in the world. Yeah. Producing her own shows. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's dope. It's you know, very dope. Me and LC sat down, and we started, like, doing our little K-pop reactions in 2020. And I was like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I want you to write these songs. And we want to direct some of these videos. And we just can't wait to show our audience, like, this is who we truly are. Like we can do this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we talk about being an artist and a filmmaker all the time, but I'm like, y'all are going to respect us when y'all see us with these people and, you know, pulling, making these moves. Cause we have like several record labels reach out to us and they want us to like, give our opinion on the song and I'm like mm -hmm. I don't want you to call me for my opinion like I want to work with you so like that is on the way and I can't wait to see it and it's happening like with so many creators it's ridiculous like my daughter is five years old she used to watch uh, a, a young rapper named Lele <laughs> she's like maybe 13 years old, but I was watching her when she was seven, eight with my daughter just jamming. My daughter's like, oh, I want to do music. And I look on Netflix and now she has a, a show, I believe, on Netflix. Hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's the power of now. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, take advantage. You know, if you are an artist, mm -hmm. take advantage, you know, put your work out there. You so. really see your dreams manifest. And I think I think it's even more powerful for us because mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. Even if I just think about my my own experience growing up, art was something I never pursued because it, it didn't seem like a like a career I could make a living from. Mm -hmm. What career can you name now that is like that? You know what I'm saying? Like a oh, kid yeah. growing up now is like shit. I can do anything. I period. Mm -hmm. I can literally do anything I want to in this world. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which is beyond powerful. Yeah. It, it was those moments for me that. I had like sort of some discouragement, you know, when I was going to college and I was an athlete and, you know, my mom was like, all right, so what do you want to study? And I was like, you know what? I think I want to pursue filmmaking. She was like, well, what job are you going to get with that? <laughs> and, you know, those moments kind of like put you in a shell. Like I literally went and started to major in finance and accounting, couldn't stay awake in class. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I got to go back to my roots. And, uh, you know, I decided to pursue filmmaking, but, you know, I think we're at a time now where it's becoming more realistic to, you know, pursue what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And for many of us creators, it's like we have this burning desire to create and do creative work. But, you know, historically in the past, we weren't rewarded for it. So we just got to find ways, you know, multiple ways to, you know, make a living. Mm -hmm. um, so... Leave, leave me with some advice, you know, as a, as a creator. Um, how do you approach your work? Do you have like a day-to-day -day on what you want to create? Or do you have like a, a eventual down the road, like big picture of what you want to create? Like, what is your process of, you know, creating, but also advice for somebody who wants to um you know work in the creative field for a living full time um i feel like there were multiple questions within that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i could have been more concise just leave me with some advice to or you know the people watching um Leave us with some 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 life advice as a creator. You know what 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 is what has this journey taught you? Um, hmm. Off top is trust your intuition. Not just trust it. Spend time cultivating and polishing that intuition. That's every absolutely everything. Like, that's your guide. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's square one. Um, just make sure you're ready for, you know, make sure you're fully in. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, it's so easy to tiptoe about pursuing your dreams. And I think that's, that's the difference between who's going to make those dreams happen and who's not. Like, how much, are you, how much of yourself are you really willing to invest? 
how much in yourself do you really believe? And when I think about my journey, it's pivotal moments in my, in my career, I was always willing to double down on myself. When I told you about Timber, like that moment was like, I'm gonna invest it in myself. I believe in me, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, I've spent so much of my life, I feel like, man, I'm so fucking talented. How has nobody come in and, but I, I also, you know, my music business experience puts me in a, it, it gives me the knowledge to know that talent isn't enough. Like, so what? There's yeah. plenty of talented people in this world, you know? Gotta give people a reason to want to support you, to, to kind of feed into what you have to offer. Um, just, you know, take time, enjoy, enjoy the process, love the process, make sure you love every step of the process. That's key, that's huge. Because like, that's where, that's when you're really tested in those moments where, where there's nothing. It's just the idea, mm -hmm. it's just the concept. There's nothing tangible there, you know, it's just like, that's when the universe demands the most from you. Cause you gotta work through that pain you got to work through the adversity to make it something. And then you still got to share it and present it and, you know, give it out to the world. It's, nah. There's so many, so many things I could share with the creator. Um, Intuition is a powerful word and I'm glad you used it. The name of our company is Higher Faculty. And where that came from was we were listening to, well, I was listening to a guy by the name of Bob Proctor and he talks about you have these higher faculties. Um, imagination, intuition, perception, willpower, memory. And, you know, I just kind of flipped it and made it my own, like higher faculty. You know, faculty is kind of a play on words. You know, you have higher faculties and then faculty as in like teaching. Mm -hmm. So when you say intuition, I'm like, oh, that's perfect alignment. <laughs> like the stars are aligning right now. but. Um, it's huge to go inside as a creator, you know, it's like you have to quiet the noise around you, you know, people, you know, not believing in you, um, looking at other people's work and trying to judge yourself, you know, and, you know, especially with social media and the likes and the subscribers and everything, but ultimately you got to go inside. I mm -hmm. feel like that's where all creation comes from, you know. A car didn't exist. There was no blueprint for a car. Somebody had to go inside and, you know, make that come to fruition. So I think real, you, you, the, the, the key is inside of you, you know, and not to cut you off, but I, I feel like that's huge. That, that, that's a huge statement for. Yeah. I mean, the intuition, like that, that leads everything. Mm -hmm. I can every single day i'm using my intuition even in the simplest simplest moments and i just i appreciate it that much more every time i do something and i listen to my intuition and i see it and i'm just like yes like mm -hmm. it just every time you have those moments it's like you double down on your intuition you know like you realize like okay that's not just a random voice you know what i'm saying like it's guiding me to do exactly what i need to do Mm -hmm. I can tell you those times in life that I have not listened to my intuition, like, st like strictly went against it. Mm -hmm. It was all bad. Oh yeah, all bad. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know without knowing, you know. <laughs> no, I agree, and um, I just lost my train of thought. I was gonna say, um, what made you say yes to this interview? You know, you talk about intuition, I, I was pondering, like, he could have easily said no. You know, he's got a lot going on. Um, you know, what about the idea inspired you or, you know, what, what, what made you sit down with, with, with higher faculty? Well, like I've already said in this conversation, relationships are everything, mm -hmm. you know. So you guys came highly referred from my brother droid you know like mm -hmm. so off top i'm like okay like we've been rocking like this my you know it's my brother like mm -hmm. we've been rocking for a long time and if he were if he tells me like yo check this out i'm gonna check it out yeah. period mm -hmm. um so you got that off top and then once i you know actually saw what you guys were doing mm -hmm. um 
it was just like okay i was i was at least open to hearing what you had in mind yeah. and then when we connected on the facetime like that's what made it real for me mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm again intuition like intuition ties into how you connect with people like just being able to read situations and reading people like mm -hmm. i don't i'm i've been blessed with incredible intuition so i don't really need to see too much for too long to mm -hmm. know what's what you know what i'm saying so yeah. as soon as we sat down and talked we chopped it up for a couple minutes i was like nah these some real brothers like let's connect yeah i appreciate that i appreciate that and it was something i was i was wondering like you know what like the stars feel like they're aligning like he's you know aligned with you know what we want to do and we you know what we feel like we're called to do and like we want to share your story and celebrate you know black creators not but you're just more than that you're, you're a creator and you know once we caught wind of the work that you've been putting in i was like you know what this is what i want to do you know um Eventually, like, I want this to be, well, I, I won't say just bigger than just a, a YouTube video. I mean, it's more than that right now, but I'm thinking 10 years down the road, like, I want people to be able to, to, to watch this for hours and be inspired, mm -hmm. get game, get knowledge. You know, maybe it's a book one day, you know, but... You know, I want to I want people to be here and 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 see that you can transcend what society tells you you need to be. You know, nobody nobody told you that you should be an artist. <laughs> like I don't think growing up somebody was like, you know what, man, maybe you should pursue art. Man, and and, no. and it's possible. And it's I possible. was told the opposite. I was I was kind of like how your your parents were like, you get that security. I yeah. majored in civil engineering. Wow. And I was like, I think I dropped out. I was just like, I was, that was not, no, it was not for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my interest whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, taking that time, I'm so glad I, I did that. And that was, that was really like the start of me kind of taking control of my life and getting behind the driver's wheel and like, okay, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. I was driving around for a while to, you know, but it's like once I was in control, that was everything. Yeah. That was everything. Mm -hmm. Now it's about, okay, I will do anything in my power to make sure my dreams happen. Yeah. Period. Don't. Vaccine, man. I appreciate all that you do. I appreciate your time. Uh, I will have some of your pieces in our studio back home at Middletown, Ohio. I might have to sell a kidney or something. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever. You don't need that. You don't need it. <laughs> right. I heard you can survive with one. So I'm going to do what I need to do to get one. So, no, nah, man, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity, man. And, uh, you know, just, just end by telling people how they can support you and check out your work. First off, I appreciate you all oh, much, much love for just tuning in and, and you know, giving us some of your time and, and energy. Uh, you can check me out vaccine.com, uh, vaccineart.com. And that's V-A-K-S-E-E-N, vaccineart.com, at vaccine, social media, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. Yeah, tap in. A lot, a lot of dope things up ahead. Definitely looking forward to connecting. Hey, peace and love. Peace.